For a little context, this story happened sometime between 2013 and 14 in the Philippines. My mum would wake up my little sister at five in the morning and make her breakfast downstairs of our house. Then she would take a shower upstairs in our parents' bathroom, whilst my sister eats her breakfast alone downstairs in the lounge while she watches TV. Then my mum would call out my sister's name from the hallway upstairs after she finishes showering to make her go upstairs and then she would help her get ready for school. My sister gets picked up by our driver to school very early to avoid traffic because the traffic is so bad in the Philippines. Anyway, my mum and my little sister have had this routine for years and nothing unusual ever happened. However, one day, when they were doing their usual morning routine, my mum, who was showering, heard a scream coming from the first level of our house and she knew that it was my little sister. She was in the shower, so she couldn't get out immediately. My mum grabbed a towel to cover herself and then rushed outside the hallway to call my little sister and ask her to come upstairs, but my sister answered, No, I can't. I'm scared. My mum didn't pay too much attention to what my little sister said as she thought she was just imagining things. My mum asked her a couple of more times to come upstairs, but my little sister would answer the same thing over and over. Eventually, my mum was able to convince my sister to go upstairs. However, instead of taking the quickest way to the stairs, my little sister went around the centre table of our lounge and then around the kitchen table, seemingly avoiding something along the way to the stairs. Then my mum was helping her get ready for school. She asked my sister what happened downstairs, but my sister didn't reply and she just kept crying. Then, fast forward to the same day my little sister comes home from school and my mum asked her what happened earlier that day and my sister said, while I was sitting on the couch, I leaned forward to plug in the TV and then when I sat back up, there was a lady wearing a brown dress with a very long nose sitting on the other end of the couch. She looked like a witch. And that's where my sister went around the centre table in our lounge and the kitchen table because she would have walked past the witch if she didn't. This happened years ago and it still scares me to this day. The incident happened to me and a friend a month ago. It was not my first paranormal experience, but definitely one that made me think a lot about it again. We were outside at around 6pm, having a walk in my hometown, when it was already dark, when I ran out of tobacco. We went to a nearby corner store, I got my stuff, and afterwards we were on our way to my home. On the way, there is, I believe, a former Jewish gravesite, now a park on the left side. I wanted to smoke one before we went, but since the park is often visited by strangers, we surpassed it and sat down nearby on a small wall, rolling up. When I wanted to start smoking, I noticed a light flickering inside one of the apartments on the right side of the street. You could see through the window into what looked like the dinner room with a light bulb, which seemed really weak, therefore causing the flickering light. When I kept watching though, I noticed shadowy silhouettes moving in a fast and weird way. But there was nothing in front of the bulb to produce such shadows. When I wanted to tell my friend, he told me he had just seen it and was curious about what it was. The first thing I did was getting my phone and trying to film the incident. But whenever I moved the camera to the specific window with the creepy shadows, my phone screen just turned dark. When I moved the camera object away from the window, the screen returned to normal. I tried this like five or six times, always failing to take a picture or a video because my phone screen wouldn't let me. I could have filmed anything else fine, except for that window. When I put my phone away, the light bulb suddenly stops flickering and shines like it's been freshly exchanged. It didn't flicker a single time afterwards and we sat there for like 20 minutes before it seemed nearly dead kind of creeped out and continued our walk, but it still gives me chills when I think about it. I was still attending college. I remember it was a sunny day. 
I decided to go hiking toward the mountain. The summer heat didn't stop me from walking up those paths. The trees did give me shade though, so sunstroke was not an immediate issue. I brought a few bottles of water and a few snacks so that I could eat when I sat down to take a break. I also knew the paths well, so it was impossible for me to get lost. Yet, in spite of that fact, I managed to get lost. I was daydreaming when I noticed I went off the beaten path. I managed to get off the path and hiked into the woods. It was getting late, so I tried to get out of the woods or orient myself to get back to the path, but to no avail. As I was desperately trying to get out, trying to call someone on my phone even, there was no reception. I knew there were no cave systems in the area, nor any real caves to be honest, but I managed to find one. It started raining, so I took shelter inside of the small opening. It only went for about 10 meters. After that, I managed to get inside. It wasn't dark inside, I could see rather well but I didn't see the ledge behind the spot I sat down in. As I leaned back, trying to relax while I waited for the rain to stop, I fell, and it wasn't a small drop. I fell for what felt like a few dozen meters, only to hit a soft surface. As I regained my composure, I opened my eyes only to see I landed in a thick moss. It didn't look like anything I ever seen before. It was thick and soft enough to soften my fall so that I didn't get hurt too much. I did feel sore and had a few cuts from the rocks I scraped during my not so graceful fall. I looked up to see the opening from which I emerged, only to see a pitch black hole above. I got up from the soft moss and looked forward. Another opening. No, that's, that's not impossible, I muttered to myself as I saw light from what appeared to be an entrance to the cave where I now lay. I should be underground, I told myself as I got up. I couldn't smell ozone, I said there was no rain. Well, I shouldn't because I was underground, but I wasn't. I trotted toward the opening and I was blinded by the sun for a few moments. A clear sky, a clear purple sky. I thought my eyes were playing tricks on me. Then I looked toward the forest in front of me. The grass had a reddish way alongside the leaves on the trees. The trees were alien to me. They were tall and looked more like mushrooms. But there was no mistake in it. They were trees. They had branches and leaves on them. I started walking forward, unable to comprehend what the hell I was looking at. Was I in a coma? I thought to myself. No, this must not be real. I'm dreaming, right? I pinched myself, and sure as hell I felt the pain. I slapped myself a few times for good measure. I wasn't waking up. How hard did I hit my head? Am I dead? The thought occurred to me, but it all felt real. The sight and even the sounds were all foreign to me. I heard some kind of chirping, but it sounded more like high-pitched wailing. I walked in a daze for God knows how long, soon started to become dark, so I decided to pick up some sticks and try to light a fire. I had a lighter with me, so it shouldn't be that difficult. I went around searching for some dry sticks when I heard some kind of noise just above the trees, shuffling the leaves. I thought at first it must be wind, but then a creature that resembled a monkey emerged dangling from a thick branch on a tree that was quite a distance from me. It was near enough I could discern its features. It was hairless, with skin white as snow, four black eyes and four arms with two legs. On each arm, and on both of its legs, it had five fingers. We were both motionless, in some sort of staring contest. The creature blinked with two eyes on the top, and then the bottom two were making some sort of shrieking noise and disappearing into the tree above. I was shocked. I thought it ran from me. I thought it saw me as a threat, but I saw something much, much worse. I could hear growling from behind me. I slowly turned around to see a massive beast of a creature. It also had four eyes. This one had black fur. Its teeth had two rows and its saliva dripped onto the red grass below. It looked like an oversized alien bear 
and it was hungry. I backed away slowly, making careful steps so as not to trip. Then the beast started running toward me, roaring just like a bear. But if that bear smoked for most of its life, a deep guttural sound that was, it's still ingrained into my memory to this day. I turned and ran, not looking back. I went in a zigzag pattern between the trees in order to lose the monstrosity, but it kept up with me. As I ran, I felt like I was making more distance between the creature and myself. As I thought I was escaping, I tripped on a large rock and fell face first into the grass. I turned around to see where the bare thing was. It was still barreling toward me. I picked up the rock I tripped on so I could throw it into the oncoming monster. To my horror, an eye opened up on the rock. It looked straight at me. I screamed and threw the rock toward the four-eyed bear. To my surprise, the rock excreted some kind of liquid that quickly turned into a gas. It distracted the bear, and from the looks of it, the gas irritated its eyes. I looked around quickly. I didn't know where to go. I remembered I had a small pocket knife in my backpack. I quickly managed to get it out and open it. I hid behind it. I kept silent. The bare thing recovered, but didn't seem to have the will to find me. I heard its heavy footsteps fade into the distance. Once I couldn't hear them, I looked at where the bear was. I saw the rock, its eyes opening once again. It looked around, and after a few moments, it locked its eyes on me. Then suddenly, at least a dozen insect-like legs grew from its body, and it scurried off into the forest, not breaking eye contact with me. I shuddered at the fact I held that thing in my hands. After that friendly encounter with the local wildlife, I decided to be more careful from there on. I managed to collect a few sticks and a few rocks so as not to start a forest fire. Of course, poking them with my knife or a long stick to see if they were alive. Few of them were, and they scurried off like cockroaches as the first one I encountered. Most, thankfully, were not. I managed to get a fire going. As the night crept in, it became a lot colder. During the day, it was a bit fresh, but not chilly or cold. I definitely wasn't dressed for the occasion. I had shorts and a thin, short-sleeved shirt on. Back home, it was scorching hot, as I said. During the night, I could barely sleep. I slept two hours tops. The sounds in the forest were surreal, terrifying. I still had to come to grips that I wasn't home. I was literally thrown into the unknown. You can probably say that I accidentally threw myself into the unknown, but that's beside the point. I managed to survive a few days until I ran out of snacks. I rationed them. I managed to find a stream with drinkable water, so I refilled my bottles. Food was the main problem. I did find some berries, but I didn't want to risk it just yet. Other than the weird berries, I found other strange plant life as well as wild animals. I found some sort of flower that emitted a toxin which attracted the rock. I couldn't tell you the purpose of it, it was there. Then there were spiky plants. I know we have those back home, but these had spikes which thrust themselves into any unlucky animal that happened to come close enough. After it would thrust its spikes into an animal, it would inject some kind of venom which would paralyze the animal. Then roots would grow toward the animal at great speed, and then it would just drag it underground. The first time I saw it in action, the unlucky animal was some sort of rabbit. Slightly larger and with four eyes and long ears, but it looked harmless enough. I thought of hunting one of these things, since they were quite common. I tried and failed. I had no ranged weapons, and those guys had a sixth sense. As soon as I even thought of an aggressive move toward the thing, it would pop away fast. I had no way of catching the thing. Soon enough, I became hungry. I was starving, actually. At some point, I remember running away from some sort of predator. Barely. The thing was a biped with a snout and two pure black eyes. It was slower than me, thankfully, so I managed to outrun it and hide. I can't tell you the details of how it looked, other than the general description I just gave you, though. Exhausted and hungry, I decided to test my luck on those berries. I picked the orange ones. They were slightly larger than the others. 
I ate one and waited a bit. Thankfully nothing happened. Then I ate almost the entire bush that they grew on. We had a sweet taste. I felt full for once. Then, after about an hour, I felt dizzy. I then felt sick and my head was spinning. I barely walked. I would remember walking and then seemingly going unconscious, just to wake up in the middle of doing something. Once I was punching a tree, other times I was laying on the floor, having a staring contest with one of the rock things. The rest, I don't remember. I woke up with a fever after God knows how long, but I wasn't on the forest floor. I was indoors. It was a house. Well, more like a hut. I was on a bed of furs with a towel on my forehead. I felt like I was run over by a bus. My head was aching and I still felt sick. But I wasn't in a state of delirium. I looked around and I saw there were things in the hut. A bow and quiver with some arrows. Small wooden plates of sorts and other things you'd find in a primitive hut. It was a sword made of iron or something, from what I recall. After a few moments, what appeared as a woman entered the hut. She was short from what I saw, with long white hair and red eyes. Looked like an albino woman. But it looked, I don't know, normal. I was probably still out of my mind at the time, so I'm not surprised. She rushed toward me and knelt down, telling me something in a language I didn't understand. She removed the towel and put her hand on my forehead. I do remember saying something. Of course, she didn't understand, but I'm pretty sure even if she did, it didn't make any sense. I passed out again shortly thereafter. After some time, I woke up again. This time I felt better, a bit sore, but I was back to my normal self. Beside was a small plate with food and some wooden utensils. The meal was a combination of some fruits and meats. The combination wasn't the best, but it satiated my hunger. After eating the meal, I lay down again thinking about what happened. First thing, the orange ones are like a drug, at least when consumed in large quantities. Second, there are people here. I was still confused as to how I found myself here, but I first have to find a way to survive here in order to find out where I am. After some time passed, a person entered the hut. This time it was a man. He had white hair and stretched halfway to his shoulders. Red eyes and a thick white beard. He was about my height. He came to my side and sat on the floor. He pointed at the plate and said something along the lines of, Gute elo est. I couldn't understand him, but I presumed he told me if the meal was good. I simply nodded. Do you understand me? Do you speak English? I said to him. Eknairismem, he was zag, he said, with a confused expression on his face. I tried communicating with him, but to no avail. Others joined him to try talking to me, including the young woman who I first saw when I was high on those berries. About four people were around me, asking me questions. They started pointing to things. The young woman started by picking up a spoon and saying, Spanaletta. I repeated what it was called in English. After a while, I just pointed at myself and said my name. Ray. Ray. Not my real name. The people around me started introducing themselves. The young woman's name was Tanya. The bearded man's name was Mikhail. From what I've gathered, Mikhail is a close relative of Tanya. Later in the day, I went out of the hut. There was an entire village of around 50 people at most. All had white hair and red eyes. It was a peculiar sight, although I think I was an even weirder sight since I had brown eyes and dark brown hair. After a while of going around the village alongside Mikhail and Tanya, both of them pointing at things and telling me how they were called in their language and me repeating in English, I had basic vocabulary of their language, though of course I couldn't communicate with still and help that a lot of words are surprisingly quite similar or identical to those in English. I was surprised and thankful that the locals seemed to take great care of me, showing me around the village and teaching me their language. They probably weren't cannibals, hopefully. As it became dark, I was introduced to what I assume was the village elder. 
He was an old man in the biggest hut in the village. He was bald, with only a few strands of white hair and the same red eyes. I was told to take a seat opposite of him. Then I was left alone with the old man. He looked me over, then got up with the help of his cane. He motioned to me that I remained on the floor. He grabbed a small jar containing a greyish powder and he carefully made a circle around me with the powder. He sat back down opposite of me and said a short chant. The powder around me lit up and the grey colour turned into a snow white. I apologise, I'm impatient and can't really wait for you to learn our tongue, the old man said in perfect English. W what? You speak English? He said surprised. No, no, the old man shook his head. I had heard of it, but I never learned it. This spell will only last so long. I'll ask you some questions, and then you can ask me your questions. Alright, go on. Where are you from? The old man leaned in and squinted his eyes, awaiting my answer. I answered to the best of my ability where I'm from and how I got here. I see. Your name is Ray, yes? I nod. Alright, I have met one of your kind before. A long time ago. It's a rare event, a thing of legends. Look, I don't know how I got myself into this, but can you explain to me exactly where I am? The old man considered my question for a moment and then answered. Ray, there are many names for this place, but to my village it's known as New Home, and your world is called Old Home. I took a moment to think about what he said. You mean, you came from where I'm from? A very long time ago, yes. And there are others like you? Yes and no. There are other villagers, but farther out I've seen people that look similar to you. They're newcomers. Okay. I was a bit overwhelmed, but I had one more pressing question on my mind. What in the name of all that is holy are those rock insects? The old man chuckled a bit before answering. Oh, they're the eyes of the forest. Don't be bothered by them. They're harmless unless you harm them. Even if you do, you have to be worried of the goddess's wrath instead, more than them harming you. Goddess? Platea is the goddess of the forest. She's our predator. As long as you don't harm the forest, she will not harm you. I simply nodded. The spell is going to be done soon. Any other questions? Yes. What is the name of this village? And your name as well, so I know. I am the eldest Ashtar of the Zayan village. After that, the powder around me turned black. The old man, Ashtar, motioned for me to stand up and exit. I did. Outside, Mikhail was waiting for me, and he showed me to the hut where I was originally placed. This will be my home for the time being as it stands. Days went by, and those days turned into months. I slowly leaned more and more at the language. I also started working with the villagers. They taught me how to use the bow and arrow, and I joined them in their hunts, made new friends. I got used to that life among those strange people. They worshipped the forest and her protector named Platea. I heard that she could look like a fox with nine tails or a four-eyed wolf. Her human form is that of a short woman with long black hair and, of course, red eyes. Platea blessed us in this hunt, Mikhail said, as he had the rabbit or jackalope animal that I learned they call a set was slung over his shoulder. It was indeed. Even if you were able to kill something today, Ray. Mikhail's younger brother Chris said to me as he dragged a deer-like creature called a colopa with my help. Ha, yeah, it was quite a hunt, I said casually. As our group finally got to the village, a small crowd awaited us. The last few hunting expeditions were not as successful, but now we were able to bring enough to feed the village for the time being. Five deer, twenty rabbits, and a few other smaller critters. You're back, shouted Tanya as she ran towards us. She hugged Mikhail and Chris and then finally me. She was slightly younger than me. I was in my mid-twenties at the time, and she was in her early twenties, I think. Finally, a proper meal will be had, someone said from the crowd. Was anyone hurt? Did you get attacked by the Kritkos? Tanya said. Kritkos was the bear that attacked me on the first day when I came here. No, all was well, I said. 
We were not harassed, fortunately enough, Mikhail added. Thank Platea. I'll go help prepare. You boys deserve a hearty meal, Tanya said, as she went to help the others hang up the animals and skin them. I slowly began to accept this lifestyle. I actually liked it here. Life was simple, even if I had some layers I as of yet didn't understand. Then one day, some of my neighbours and good friends got into a fight with the residents of a nearby village. It was something about them breaching our hunting grounds. The debate got heated, and one of them shot an arrow at Mikhail. I wasn't present at the time that happened. I was helping around the village at the time. I was worried that this would escalate. But I was told those things sometimes happen, and that I shouldn't worry about it. Mikhail was wounded, and still recovering when he and I were woken up in the middle of the night, to screams and shouts. Despite still being in pain, he ran out to see what was happening. I was right behind him. We saw two of the huts set ablaze, and unknown faces cutting down our friends and family. We fought. I killed one of them. I had no time to process the fact I took someone's life. It was self-defence, after all. And I still had more problems to worry about. We were outnumbered. I saw old man Ashtar helplessly swatted at the men as they plunged their spears into him. Ray, get Tanya and go. I'll hold them, Mikhail shouted at me. Tanya stood behind us with tears in her eyes. Mikhail, you're coming with us. We can es- I was cut short as an arrow went through Mikhail's throat. Tanya screamed. Mikhail fell to his knees with a panicked look in his eyes, gurgling on his own blood as he pointed toward the forest then fell face first onto the floor and remained motionless. I took Tanya by the arm and ran, and ran, and ran, and ran. She insisted on going back. I couldn't imagine how she felt. I had tears in my eyes as I stopped and looked at her. I grabbed her by the shoulders. Tanya, we can't go back. We die if we do. I desperately tried to tell her. I then saw torches in the distance. I grabbed her hand and just kept running through the dark forest. Arrows flew around us. I was struck in the shoulder, but I kept running. Then Tanya was struck in the leg. She fell. I took a quick glance at where the arrow struck her. There was no way she could walk, let alone run. I tried to pick her up and carry her. Ray, leave me. I'll slow you down. She was hitting me and pushing herself away from me. No, no. No, I'm not leaving you, goddammit, I shouted. Leave me, go, she screamed, pushing herself away and nearly toppling me over. I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I repeated to myself as I ran alone now. I looked back in the distance as the men got to Tanya. She looked at me as they grabbed her by the hair and put a blade to her neck. I saw red, and then I turned and continued running. After I escaped, I managed to get the arrow out of myself and tend to the wound as best as I could. I learned which herbs were best for preventing illness and a plant which acted as a disinfectant. I survived. But the guilt I carry is great. I considered ending it, but I knew that their death would then be all in vain. I decided to live and explore this strange new world. Months passed yet again. I stumbled upon new villages. New people and faces. I didn't stick around. I would just stay for a few days and trade and then continue. The forest seemed to have no end. For months on end I travelled through it. I thought I was going in circles, but the new villages and new people I met along the way told me otherwise. Most people of the forest are friendly, if weary of strangers. Especially myself, who doesn't look like them. Some are outright hostile and refuse anyone who encroaches on their territory. I found new animals and plants, great rivers I followed that brought me to new sites. I saw a waterfall that would probably rival Niagara Falls. I saw strange flying pieces of land that floated just below the clouds, massive reptile-like creatures that resembled dinosaurs, very similar but distinctly different in a special way, and a lot of living rocks. Nearly a year passed of me wandering the forest when I came up upon the beach. An ocean. I was slightly proud of myself that I managed to get this far. I decided to follow the beach, occasionally going into the forest in order to gather supplies and food. 
I went for a better part of two months following the beach. I finally stumbled upon a place that I hoped I could call home. The tall walls promised safety, a city, a gleam of hope and civilization, order in a chaotic world. The tall wall that greeted me was made of stone. It reminded me of a medieval city. I still wore my old hiking sneakers, but they were slowly now falling apart. I think deer fur around me to keep me warm. My beard and hair grew enough so that I basically looked like a caveman that emerged from the forest. As I approached a large field where farmland stretched as far as the eye could see, I took a small path toward one of the entrances to the city. I had a large stick that acted as a cane of sorts, which aided my aching legs. I had walked non-stop for a few days already. I was too tired and hardly noticed the weird looks I got from the farmers who worked in the fields around me. As I came upon the entrance, I saw that the wall was much taller than I expected. It rivaled the stories I'd heard of ancient city walls that once stood proud and strong back home. I did see in the distance some black smoke going into the air. I presumed it was for heating, but why heating for such a warm day? The guard approached. He was dressed in chainmail armour and a helmet that resembled those of the Roman era, but surprisingly had what looked like a rifle slung over his shoulder. He approached me calmly. I could see that he had purple eyes. It was a strange sight. He spoke to me in a foreign language. I wasn't surprised in the least, since the distance I made in the last few months is not in the least small. It felt as if this world was much larger than Earth. I spoke to the guard in English. After that failed, I attempted the language I learned in the past year in the village. I thought it wouldn't work, but surprisingly, the guard turned and called someone down. I saw another guard come down, this one much younger than the purple-eyed one in front of me. In the younger one, I could see the familiar red eyes. The purple-eyed guard said something to the red-eyed one, and then the red-eyed one spoke. He asks who you are and what brought you here. I didn't speak for a few moments, thinking of a response. I came from the forest. I didn't know that there would be a larger settlement here. I just stumbled upon it. The red-eyed guard presumably translated what I said. After that, he told me something to the red-eyed one and quickly entered the city. You know my language, but your eyes are not red, the young guard said to me. I'm not sure how I got here, to be honest with you. I was saved by one of your people's villages and lived with them for a few months, learning the language. Unfortunately, the village was attacked and destroyed. I managed to escape. I don't know if there are any other survivors. I answered the young guard who stood there, eyes wide. The village was attacked? By who? Tell me! He almost screamed at me. I was taken back by his reaction. I thought that conflicted between his people was common. I think it's the neighbouring village, I'm not sure. There was a dispute in hunting territory. The guard looked down to the ground for a moment. Then said, calmly this time, What do you first remember when you came here? I thought back to the first memory I had when I came to this strange place. I fell and found myself in a cave. I'm sure you'll not believe me, but I'm not from around here. The guard's eyes went wide once again. Wait. Brown eyes, cave, by Plato. He ran towards the city entrance. He nearly hit the purple-eyed guard who was just returning. He started speaking quickly in the language I couldn't quite understand, explaining something to the other guard. The purple-eyed guard nodded to all that he said and motioned to me that I may enter and that I follow him. I followed him, and once I entered the city, I could hear the sound of straining metal and an outburst of steam from one of the pipes protruding out of the wall gates were closing. I followed the guard further into the city. I saw many people going about their day. The streets were filled with vendors and salesmen. There were not many houses as their apartment buildings made of brick and stone. Some were more decorated than others. I saw the smokestacks from which the black smoke came from. I could hear the distinct sound of roaring steam engines from inside the large building we passed. The purple-eyed guard stopped next to what looked like an inn. He knocked on the door and waited. 
A small slit opened up on the metal door and a pair of eyes could be seen. The two went back and forth for a minute before the door opened. The guard motioned me to enter. Behind the door was a taller man with purple eyes. Most of the inhabitants had purple eyes, though I could see some people with green, blue and red eyes in contrasting colours of hair. It was quite a sight. I presumed it signified lineage or rank. The guard gave the man some coins and had some parting words with the tall man, after which he closed the door and locked it. He then led me to a room that was upstairs. He motioned me to enter the room. The room had a small desk and chair and comfy looking bed. I got my backpack on the floor when the man closed the door behind me and locked it from the outside. I banged on the door for a few moments, but there was no way I'm breaking it. I accepted my fate this time. I was simply too tired to fight back at this moment. I laid on the bed. It wasn't as soft as the one back home, but it was a huge upgrade from the cold hard ground. After about an hour, the door unlocked and a woman entered with a plate of food. She left the plate and left, locking the door behind her. If they're going to feed me, I can stay here for a while. I can plan my escape when I gather my strength back. If it will be necessary, that is. The food was marvellous. It was maybe my hunger, but it truly was good quality food all in all. After eating and feeling full, I promptly fell asleep, only to be woken up by the door being unlocked once again. This time, two different guards were waiting on the other side. They grabbed me and dragged me out. I shouted in protest and was met by a rifle barrel pointed to my head. I was silent from then on. They led me back onto the streets and dragged me to a carriage. I was forcibly sat into the vehicle and the two bulky guards sat down on both of my sides. Another two were opposite of myself. The carriage ride lasted for about 15 minutes before we stopped. Then I was dragged out and put to my feet at gunpoint. In front of me looked something akin to a mansion built in Greek style. I was escorted inside. When inside, I was treated less harshly. We walked through the endless halls. I saw men and women in white robes with some purple on them. Nobles, I would guess. They stared at me with pity or disgust, or both. I was finally in front of a large door. One of the guards knocked on the door. A voice could be heard from behind. Then, two guards opened the large double doors. I was pushed inside as the doors closed behind me once again. Oh, fuck off! I shouted at the men who threw me inside. Oh, there'll be no need for learning something new today. A shame, a voice said in English. I stood up. Who the fuck are you? I'm the king of this fine city, as well as its founder, a voice responded. I could see a large desk at which the man sat in front of. He had green eyes and seemed to be very old. God damn it! What's with your men? Are they going to treat me as a guest or prisoner? Can't they choose one? I said in protest. A laugh could be heard. Ha ha ha! Don't mind the brutes. My name is Trost II. I'm the founder of Novus Troia. Might I have your name and title? My name is Ray, and I have no title. Unless you think of my surname, that would be Aron. Ray Aron, I respond. Hmm, Ray Aron. Do you wish to live here? It would be great, but the first impression is not good, I'll have to admit. And how can you speak English? <laughs> I learned the English language less than a hundred years ago. The 3,106th year since this city's founding. A large boat made of iron and steel happened to stumble upon our city. We helped the crew, and in return they helped us. They taught us the scientific method as you call it. That's why you see the great power of steam on display throughout Novus Troia. They spoke English, but... Wait, did you say 3,100 years after? And you're the founder? And that was 100 years ago. The mortal sees, ha 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 He raised his hands into the air and then lowered them back to the desk. I have a mission to lead my people to glory that was long lost. And the faraway people of your kind aided us in that. I've sent many expeditions to find your faraway lands, but none have returned. And the men who enlightened us didn't seem to know how to return. It was a true sorrow. What do you plan on doing then? I can tell you that I'm not from this world. I somehow find myself here. Do not be silly. 
Only the great people of Troy were blessed by the gods to traverse to this land. You and your people may be enlightened, but you're not blessed by the gods. He pointed a finger at me and had a more serious tone. I will make a new expedition and you will be its head. You will lead us back to your homeland, even if it's the last thing you do. You came from the sea, that is certain. I heard you emerged from the forest and know the barbaric tongue of the red eyes. But your brown eyes say that you are not as barbaric as them. You've been fooled by them, but I applaud you for learning their foul tongue. That is indeed an, an honourable act for dishonourable people. What do you mean by dishonourable people? They saved my life. Old man, I don't care who you are. You're not going to manipulate me to go into certain death. If none had returned, even with tech that you have learned from the Brits or Americans, then I'm sure there's no end to that ocean. You'll end up on the other side of the continent of anything else. Better sail along the coast. You'll probably have better luck, I said. They saved your life? That may be true, but we will be the ones that will make you prosper. Find your way home with us, and I will grant you any wish you want. Money, women, and fame. That can all be yours if you listen to me. Those savages can only offer you destitution. And Brits or Americans? Who are those people of Brits you speak of? I know of the American people, but not the Brits. The British, old man. They also speak English. God, are you fucking annoying. Listen, I will not heed your fucking odd... I felt a pressure on my neck, as my feet could no longer feel the ground. You will listen to me, mortal, or I will throw you into Hades. He felt as if he was going to decapitate me by crushing my neck with an invisible hand. I, I heed... I barely said, I was as then thrown back onto the ground, panting and wheezing, as air filled my lungs again. Wise choice, right, Aaron? And so I became a guard in Nova's Troyer. Up until the new ships are built, I'll serve this city and Lord Tross. Even though it seemed like a simple existence, it was anything but. The quality of life was not really on par with anything back home. The food for the guards is bland and tasteless. The quarters where I slept were packed, and sometimes I slept in the towers while on duty, when the rare occurrence happened that the night was peaceful. As for the nights, oh god. When I was alone, the creatures didn't harass me for whatever reason. But when on guard duty, and ever since I came to this godforsaken city, they were relentless. When the sun is about to set, everyone rushes behind the walls. Those who are too late are left for dead outside, because we don't open the gates for anyone when the allotted time for evacuation is complete. That rule was imposed when some creature possessed a farmer. When he entered, he wrecked havoc inside, killing around 50 people before being dealt with. Us guards have to have our eyes open non-stop until dawn breaks. The creatures that emerge from the forest are unlike anything I ever saw. I did witness an array of weird creatures, but nothing too alien or unholy. The biped with two black eyes was the scariest shit I saw up until my third night as a guard. I saw them again. Not only that, there were many of them. And other goddamn creatures. I'm trembling just remembering those things. Other than that tall biped with the bear things and a thing that is similar to the biped. It walked on two legs but was freakishly tall with arms that stretched to the floor. It had a human-like face with black sockets for eyes and a constant frown, completely hairless. It would scream into the night with a primal shriek. I remember seeing it for the first time as it trudded toward the hall. Its height was about two-thirds the wall's height, but if it extended its arms, it would be able to reach us without a problem. The tall men, as the residents of Novus Troya called them, were one of the bigger threats. They aren't that common but aren't uncommon either. Every week on average, a pack of them would emerge. Luckily, we would know in advance as they shriek and tower over the trees. Seeing the silhouettes of them approach is terrifying in of itself. Once we point a light at them, it's even more so. The tall men are one of many. We have the crawlers. They're spider-like creatures that climb the walls. They're common, but the wall has protective measures against them. And even if a few of them come up, they're killed with one or two bullets. Their appearance is that of a spider, as I've said. They have a vaguely human face on the front of its body. Black sockets for eyes. 
It looks vaguely like the face of an infant, actually. It's really disturbing. It has six eyes that it uses for vision, though, and they're located next, slightly above the face. The body is identical to a spider, though it's around a metre tall and it's around two metres in length. Now for the crown winner of Miss or Mr. Terrifying, the Minotaur, or as I like to call him, Bethlehemet. Probably didn't write it correctly, but if you know, you know. He or she, as opposed to its monster kin, is not numerous. There's one. And he appears rarely, once in a blue moon. More realistically from what I've heard every few years. And when it does, it leaves a trail of death and destruction in its wake. He appears on calm nights, when you least expect it. It starts with voices in your head telling you all sorts of horrible things. It starts mild and progressively gets worse and worse. People then try to find where he's hiding in order to shoot him. You can't kill him, but you can hurt him so that he just fucks off. But he hides really well or is too far away. People did find him. Those few who saw him and lived to tell the tale retell the story of a being in a meditation pose, sitting on the floor with one arm raised next to his face, thumb and index finger raised completely while its middle finger is extended halfway. It has the body of a man, the head of a bull or goat, with long horns. If he comes, the casualties are large. Mostly suicides. Men shoot themselves or throw themselves off the wall to stop the voices. Others are seemingly possessed and attack their brothers in arms like savage animals. Most deaths on the wall guard are actually attributed exclusively to Minotaur. That thing is more dangerous than all the other creatures combined. But tales are told of the original threat, a legend that is worshipped by a small minority of people in the city. Platea. She is the goddess and protector of the forest. She is either in the form of a fox with nine tails or a wolf. Sometimes she's depicted in the form of a young black-haired woman with piercing red eyes. Now, she wasn't seen by anyone alive on the guard. Those are only legends. But I believe that I'm now home and writing this to you because of her. It was a day I will remember till I go into the ground. That day was my last as a guard of Nova Troia. I was preparing for my journey and my eventual death. Because of the creatures of the forests are like this, God knows what's hiding beneath the waves. The night was calm, yet something didn't feel right. The Minotaur came to mind, but I somehow knew it wasn't him. The night passed uneventfully. I remember as I departed to the ocean on a clear day, yet in moments, dark clouds rolled in. Clouds so dark that the day was turned into night. Then I remember hearing shots and screaming from the land. The city in the distance erupted into chaos from an unknown force. I remember a flying eagle soared above as rain started pouring and as thunder slammed around us. The waves were taller and taller with each passing moment. The eagle came closer and closer. The crew began shooting at it, but it was useless. The bullets only seemed to irritate the bird. But soon enough, that bird turned into a woman with long flowing black hair and eyes red as blood. She landed on the deck of the ship and started slaughtering the crew. I still remember the screams of the men pleading for mercy as she ripped them apart like nothing. Then suddenly, apart from the rain and waves, there was silence. Footsteps approached me as I cowered in a corner, soaking wet from the rain. I couldn't even let out a whimper. I was scared beyond comprehension. The footsteps stopped in front of me and I opened my eyes to see the woman in front of me. She had a loose black gown that fit her black hair and contrasted her pale skin. I stood up. She raised her hand and said one word. One word by one person that sounded like it was told by hundreds simultaneously. Return. Then, with a flick of a wrist, I was thrown overboard by an unseen force. I was constantly bombarded by the waves. Water began filling my lungs and I felt as if I was in a whirlpool of water being dragged deeper and deeper below. Then I saw only black and heard no other sounds. I woke up on a boat with people who looked normal. They spoke another language, but it was a language I recognised. I was saved by local Cuban fishermen in the Bermuda Triangle of all places. 
which was on the other side of the world where I originally fell into that hole in the small cave. Now, I never had any close family, so my disappearance was not immediately noticed. But I decided to take the chance and rebuild my life. I changed my name and identity. I live far away from my birthplace. If I would ever tell my story to anyone, they would call me insane. You too may think that as well. But heed my word. If you see any strange openings or have a strange feeling in certain places, leave and avoid them. It might be an adventure, but it might as well be an involuntary adventure. If you seek such thrills, I can't stop you. I can tell you they have a pattern and that they have cleverly placed around the world. That's as much as I know. Be careful out there, wherever you are. This happened to me when I was about 9 to 11 years old. I was spending the summer in a smallish town in North Dakota with my dad. He lived in an old apartment building full of old people on a corner with lot with huge trees. Out front was a plaque commemorating a church that once existed on that same spot. There was always a creepy vibe around the whole place, but not many tangible things happened. I do remember sleeping under a big comforter on hot summer nights and sweating profusely because I was too afraid to be exposed to whatever creepiness lurked in the dark corners of my room. There was one night that I heard the bathroom fan on and sink running, as if someone were brushing their teeth or shaving in the wee hours. He said it wasn't him, but who knows? On the day of my most memorable experience in that apartment, my dad was at work, so I was home alone at the apartment, doing what unattended kids did in 2001 drinking Mountain Dew and playing around on the internet. I was there all morning and all afternoon, enjoying my independence. Late afternoon rolled around, and I decided it was time to log off and ride my bike across town to my grandma's house. I turned off all the lights and shut the door to leave. I realised within a few seconds that I forgot to lock the door, so I turned around and reopened it. As I opened the door, I heard a rustling sound. It sounded like someone digging through plastic grocery bags under the sink. And then I saw him. There was a man standing in the kitchen, leading cowboy style with one bent leg against the counter and sink area. He had a cowboy type hat on and was looking down. He was a solid black shadow, seemingly flat with no dimension. Then he turned his head to look up at me while stark white eyes that made no sense and a creepy white slow smile. I screamed, holy shit, and slammed the door shut, not caring that it was unlocked. I ran so fast down the three stories of stairs to get the heck out of that building and to the safety of grandma's house. Coincidentally, as I exploded through the front door of the building, I crashed into my dad who was just getting home. I didn't explain anything to him and just kept going. Fast forward years later, I'm a teenager living with my mom in Minnesota. I had a few girlfriends sleeping over at my house and we were all camped out in the living room, which shares an open concept design with the kitchen. The next morning, one of my friends told me she saw a creepy man in the pantry of the kitchen. I told her it must have been my mom's boyfriend. She was creeped out and said no, definitely not him. She then described the man she saw. It was exactly what I had seen several years prior and a state away at my dad's. Each experience would be creepy on its own, but combined? I felt afraid, paranoid, and violated. How long is this thing be around? Who is it, and what is it? Is it there when I can't see it? So many questions. No sighting since, but many, many other paranormal experiences throughout my life. It was around 1995 or so, would have been my sister's ninth birthday, since I was 13 at the time, and she's four years younger than me. We had a birthday party. Kids over doing kids do. It was a good time. Late in the evening, we decided to have a seance of sorts. We fashioned a spirit board out of notebook paper. We put all the letters and numbers and phrases on it with a marker, and then we took a shot glass from the cabinet to use as a... What the devil are those things called? A planchette. The thing that points to the letters. 
My mom acted as a medium with her hands alone on the shot glass while we asked the spirits different questions. I remember getting to, into an argument with a spirit that claimed to be Elvis Presley, but I don't remember why. I brazenly told Elvis that I hoped Graceland burned to the ground. Kids, my mom told me to shut up and knock it off. Then we talked to someone who identified himself as Brian Long. We were living in Commerce City, Colorado at the time, which is the home of Adams City High School, where I would have attended a year and a half or so from that point in time had we not moved away. This is noteworthy and necessary to include, because Brian claimed he was once a student of Adams City High School, though I don't remember what time frame he provided, if he provided one at all. I have a vague memory that it was the recent past, but I cannot remember anything more than this. He said that he drowned while on vacation. I want to say somewhere on the West Coast. Anyway, he was a friendly spirit, and I took a liking to him right away. We all did. Some may, understandably, suspect that my mom was controlling the shot glass and making things up as she went along. I might be able to convince myself of that. Except for what happened next. Remember I said it was my sister's birthday? Brian said he wanted to wish her a happy birthday. There was a small candle burning several feet away, and he said, watch the candle. We all turned and looked. As we did, the flame gradually faded until it was nearly out. Then it popped back up again. We turned back to the board, goosebumps running up our bodies. And Brian said, happy birthday. I'd like to take this opportunity to explain a few things. Someone immediately said, your mom did it. My mom was on the other side of the room. She would not have been able to blow a gust of air from that distance strong enough to achieve this effect. And even if her lungs were powerful enough to do so, Exhaling that hard would have made a noise that would have been immediately heard and felt. Maybe it was one of the other kids. Nope. We were all several feet away. Not as far as mom, but far enough that it would have been noticed by everyone else. Maybe it was a trick candle and she rigged it. The seance thing was a random, spur-of-the-moment thing that we hadn't planned on. She would have had to have known we were going to do it ahead of time in order to set up the trick candle. As Sherlock Holmes once said, once you eliminate everything else, whatever is left, no matter how probable, is the truth. Brian was really there. Was he who he claimed to be? He seemed benign enough. Friendly, warm, for a dead person. He had a lot of life in him. Which is why we chose to talk to him several more times. We always asked for Brian. Brian was always happy to talk to us. Eventually, though, it came to an end. I don't remember if we all just got busy with other things, or if my mom got tired of playing medium for us, but eventually we stopped talking to him. Well, everyone else did. I continued having sessions alone. I liked this dead kid. I considered him a friend. Then, one day, I asked for Brian and got a different spirit. Where's Brian? I asked. Moved on, not Brian replied. You mean he went to heaven? I said. Yes. The spirit answered. That's when I put the spirit board away and stopped altogether. My friend was gone. I didn't really want to talk to Elvis again. Playing with the spirit board stopped being fun. So today I was on my bed talking to my boyfriend. And then something caught my eye from the window. It was like tiny white lights dancing and flying around in the air outside. I thought I was seeing stars, you know, the ones you see when you sneeze too hard and so on. But I looked into my room and I didn't see them. So I looked out the window again and see if they go over the frame of my window to know it's light stars from that. And they weren't. They were literally outside. There was no sun in my eyes or outside was too bright. They were still dancing and floating around. And it was one of the stars. To me, they go pretty quickly. And after I blinked a couple of times, they go. But they were there for a long time, even after I stopped looking out for a while and didn't see them inside. As soon as I looked out the window and it was getting darker outside, I still saw them. This is why I can't explain it. I was also in awe when looking at them, which I never experienced with stars after sneezing or something like that. I didn't tell my boyfriend because he would only have made fun of me 
I genuinely couldn't explain it. 